Good morning, everyone, and welcome to On the Horizon. <clears throat> this morning, you've joined us in uh, listen-only mode. We are recording, and we'll be on, this uh, video will be on demand viewing on our website uh, later today. We'll send an email out so folks can find it. You can find it at mainchamber.org backslash webinars. To reduce the background noise, all audience members are participating in listen-only mode. Please mute your line uh, when you're not speaking to reduce noise. If you have any questions, you can click on the raise your hand button. Uh, but it's probably better if you pop your questions right into the chat panel, and we'll get to your questions as time allows. Thank you for joining us. And to welcome you this morning, here's Dana. Thank you, Angie. And yes, uh, I certainly do welcome you. And uh, on this bright, sunny morning preceding a snowstorm. Um, this is On the Horizon, and for those who have joined us in the past, you know what to expect. For anyone that's joining us for the first time, let me say it is our opportunity to not only introduce you to the Chamber's advocacy team, but they will present be presenting to all of you an initial look at the first session of the 131st legislature that has already begun. And I wanna introduce them, but before I do that, I certainly wanna take a moment to introduce our sponsors and to express our appreciation for allowing us to provide this type of program uh, for you. And I begin with our presenting sponsor, Hammond Lumber Company, but also a number of supporting sponsors who are AARP of Maine, Amera Health, Eaton Peabody Attorneys at Law, uh, Enbridge, First Light, Kennebec Savings Bank, Northeast Delta Dental, and Sun Life. Again, I repeat, but do so with sincerity. Thank you very, very much. Now to introduce our team, which I am pleased and proud to be able to do. Our vice president that oversees advocacy is Linda Caprera. Um, ben Lucas, uh, also a senior representative. Um, and he, well, let me go back to Linda for a moment. In addition to managing the team, she also oversees and interacts with taxation committee as well as appropriations. Ben Lucas, uh, it has those committees of energy, utilities, technology, and environment, natural resources. Uh, Peter, we're pleased to have with us as a consultant after spending 29 years with us at the chamber, still carries the brand for us in human resource and labor activities. And Simon West, who is also the head of our educational foundation, follows workforce and energy issues. Our program today is kind of put forth in, in two separate efforts. One is to give you a look at the legislature, and we offer our perspective in that regard. I say perspective, not predictions. It's too early to make any type of prediction with certainty, certainly. But when you do look at the number of new legislators and seven out of 10 uh, leaders into their position, this position at least for the first time, there is more that will come and more that we will know going forward. Linda's gonna kick it off by taking an overall look of uh, the legislature. Uh, Ben's gonna follow with looking at the bills and some of the committee assignments. Peter is also gonna be looking at the process as we come out of, and I use those words carefully, the pandemic, what is the process gonna look like? And then Simon will take us to the second portion where we're gonna look at a number of the bills. I, uh, I say number of the bills to date because clearly there, is, there are many more to come. And um, a number of those that we already have are in title only. And you're gonna hear more about that as we go forward. But we'll also, in the time we have with you, be sharing what our initiatives are as well. We'll probably start off talking about each of them with what are the priorities? What are bills that we submitted uh, with sponsorships? We'll also take a look at, even though it's early, some that we already have an indication that we'll, we will oppose. And there are a number that uh, we're simply saying at this point, we're concerned and more that we need to know, or maybe it's a title and we need to know the language. But I will say this before I turn it over to, to Linda. 
This is early in the session, not unlike the first session of any legislature. There are a lot that we do not know. And uh, that's simply a reflection of the early days of any session. And whether that's about policy or partisanship, not only what they do, but how they're going to do it. Um, time will tell us a lot more of that. And we certainly commit to keeping you up to date, whether it's our one voice that we provide for our business community at 830. Every Monday, unless there's a holiday on Monday and it falls on Tuesday. And then we follow that with working with our local and regional chambers. We also will have our weekly impact that will provide you a snapshot of what's going on that week or what we think lies ahead. And also our policy committees no longer meet every month, they meet every week. So there's a lot that we will continue to provide you up to date on. But there's one issue that will help give us a glimpse into not only what they do, but more importantly, how they do it. And that is the budget. The budget in the first session is the big issue, no question about that. And the big question there will be, will it be a two thirds, which most of us propose be the way, or will it be a simple majority? It will tell us a lot. But I will tell you this, even though we say there's a lot more to come and there's a certain level of, of uncertainty, this part I can predict with certainty that you have representing you by way of the State Chamber of Commerce, very, you have very, four very profound professional, able, committed representatives that you're about to hear from that will look out for your interest. You have four who know that it's the policy, not the politics, that determines the positions that we take. We are committed to work with both parties and with all legislators. So with that, Linda, I'm going to ask you to kick it off. Thank you, Dana, and welcome, everyone. Um, well, when we look at the perspectives for the session, um, one, one word comes to mind. It's, I think it's a session of the unknowns, like Dana said. There's a lot of unknowns here that we don't know. Um, one of the things we do know is the makeup of the House and Senate really hasn't changed. I mean, you, on the Senate side, you have 22 Dent Ds, 13 Rs. That hasn't changed. On the House side, you have 82 Dent Ds, um, 67 Rs. They did pick up one C and two independents. The numbers really haven't changed, but what has changed is there are a lot of new legislators. There's 59 new legislators in the House alone, according to the clerk's office, that have never served before. There's four in the Senate that have never served before. That's huge. Those numbers are huge. What does that mean? When it comes to institutional memory, that there's, it's not there with respect to the history of programs, of issues that the legislature has dealt with. That institutional memory has to be gained. And there's an education process that goes along with that. We are up to the challenge for the issues that we deal with. We know we're gonna to have to educate some folks on that. New, as far as um, new, there's a whole new leadership. Leadership with the exception of the, of the Senate Ds, it's all new leadership. Um, Troy Jackson's still a Senate president. You have um, Matty Daughtry and Eloise Vitelli leaders. You have in the Senate on the R side, uh, Trey Stewart and Lisa Kime. On the House side, you have Rachel Talbot Ross, Mo Terry, and um, Kristen Cloutier. On the R side, you have Billy Bob Fockenham and Amy Arada. Most of leadership is new. How they're going to manage their caucuses is unknown. How they're going to manage their relationships across the aisle, down the hall with the House and Senate, and really on the second floor with the governor's office. That's all of that is unknown. Um, there's a lot to it. So we're going to have to wait and see. It's really a wait and see thing. We did meet, I will share with you, we did meet with leadership this, this week um, and right before Christmas. We were all very impressed with what they said to us, their willingness to work with us, their willingness to uh, understand that there are some very complex issues, um, very um, large issues that we're going to have to deal with. But in, in meeting with them, what we learned is on both sides of the aisle, there are issues that really, I think they're gonna be able to agree with. Um, issues like affordable housing, issues like innovation, R&D, um, issues like childcare, workforce. These are huge issues that they all mentioned. And I think you're gonna see some legislation come out on this, this session, which is a good thing. I will share with you um, some of our meetings with them. 
um, did ask them if I could share this. They absolutely said yes. With the Senate Ds, we met with um, Eloise and Maddie before, uh, I think right after Christmas. Maddie is big on paid family leave. This is gonna be a big issue for her. Mm -hmm. Housing is gonna be a big issue for her. Um, Brewers Guild regulations, incentives for trail development. Those are some of the things that she mentioned. Um, Eloise said energy, procurement of, um, of process, um, private roads, housing. Those are some of the issues that are gonna be big for, for Eloise. Senate R's, when we met with them, um, Trey said there's gonna be one press event every week and they're gonna roll out their policies and their priorities. So once a week, they're gonna meet, he thinks on Tuesday, and they're gonna hold the press event. Um, issues for the Senate R's, energy, PFAS, budget, workforce, welfare reform. These are some of their major issues. We met with the House D's, Mo Terry and um, Kristen Cloutier uh, on Tuesday as well. Mo said child care is a huge issue for her. Um, focus, they're going to focus on caucus issues. Kristen said paid family medical leave is a, is a big issue for her. Mm -hmm. But overall, they're going to focus on some of the important issues for the caucus. And they really didn't elaborate much more on that. Um, House R's, uh, lower energy cost, costs, lower taxes, red tape regulations, lower income taxes. Those were some of the things that they talked about, um, individual lower income taxes. So those are some of the things that that caucus talked about. But overall, you know, those folks really, I, I'm very encouraged by what I heard because they've asked for our help again on some of the very um, important issues that we're going to be facing on PFAS, paid family medical leave. And I think some of the other issues that they're very interested in seeing something done on, the affordable housing, the, the child care, we're going to be able to work with those on. So I'm very encouraged by our meetings. Um, and uh, we know them very well. So I think we're gonna work really well together. So that's kind of an overview of, and I'll turn it over to Ben. Yeah, thanks Linda and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, you know, from my perspective, I, I just wanted to add a little bit more context of, you know, some of the things that we, we do know right now. Uh, and, and that deals with, you know, legislation and, and, and bill titles that have been released. Uh, so earlier this week, uh, the revisor's office did release bill titles. Um, there were a little over 2,200 bill titles that were released, uh, right around 2,100 that came from members of the legislature and another 100 or so roughly that came from uh, departments and, and various other uh, you know, state agencies. Um, you know, I, I think anytime you go through titles, uh, you know, you really don't get a whole lot out of it other than being able to highlight a few that you know catch your eye to keep an eye on that that we think are, are going to be of of concern to the business community uh, for this upcoming session, whether it's a you know a, a negative impact or a positive impact. So um, you know certainly we're able to go through the titles. Uh, there's a lot of legislation that has been introduced, uh, a lot of different ideas, uh, you know, sort of all over the board. Uh, we saw some legislators that submitted you know 75 plus bill titles. Uh, for from you know their own personal capacity, um, you know so that's kind of where we you know where we where we stand in terms of uh, the overall workload that could be facing the legislature. Um, you know wh where we kind of stand right now. There's been a little over 200 uh, pieces of legislation that have actually been printed with language. I think there are a, a few pieces of legislation in there that we'll we'll talk about later, which have uh, you know already caught some some folks uh, internally. Um, you know, kind of their perspective and, and, you know, the impacts that it could have on, on the business community, um, you know, but again, say, you know, right now from, you know, from my perspective, uh, there's much more to come. Uh, it's very, very early in the session. Uh, we will learn more and, and have a better sense of where things stand uh, towards the end of January. Um, some legislative committees have already started scheduling public hearings for, for the first week uh, of, of February. Um, you know, committee assignments uh, on top of the, the bill titles that were previously, re previously released, um, you know, committee assignments did come out. Uh, there are a few remaining uh, or, or rollover chairs, I, sh I should say, of, of some committees. But, um, you know, to Linda's point, I, I think, you know, the committee structure, as is always the case with, with any new legislature, there's a lot of new faces that get, um, you know, get assigned to, uh, you know, to various committees. So, um, you know, as we continue to learn more as, as 
more bills are printed and, and bills that are either, you know, priority for the chamber or of concern to the chamber. Uh, as Dana, you know, mentioned in, in his opening remarks, we have, you know, several avenues that, um, you know, we will use to, to communicate with membership and other interested parties about what they need to be aware of. But again, uh, right now, overall workload of, of what we're looking at for the legislature, they'll have, you know, 2,200 pieces of legislation that they'll have public hearings, work sessions on uh, over over the next six months. So, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say it is going to be, uh, you know, a, a very busy uh, next few months here. Uh, but, you know, the chamber is is prepared to, to take on the workload and, and, you know, advocate for, uh, you know, for the business community. So I know uh, I'm going to turn it over to Peter now, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about the process and, and how the, the legislature is responding coming out of the, you know, the post-COVID world that we we dealt with for the last two years. Thanks, Ben. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's nice to see such a, a big crowd to listen to what we think may happen um, in the first session of the 131st legislature. Um, as Ben indicated, um, <clears throat> the last two years, if you were a lobbyist involved with government affairs, have been challenging because of the restrictions put on the public participation process by necessity due to COVID-19. Um, and so when this legislature was elected, there was a lot of discussion about how the legislature would proceed and would there be front-facing public hearings and work sessions. Short answer to that question is yes. Um, as Ben indicated, committees have been assigned um, and uh, there are basically the, the committee structure um, is really a, a very unique mixture of uh, new and, and experienced legislators, um, at least in the committees that I'm involved with right now. But um, one, of the, one of the challenges of this legislature with the presiding officers is the fact that to a large extent, you have two freshman classes. Um, the legislators who were involved in the 130th legislature dealt with uh, public hearings and work sessions the same way we're conducting this meeting this morning via Zoom. Uh, th they did meet occasionally, um, as a full legislature in the last month of the session. But it was pointed out in the Labor Committee at their orientation this week that that committee actually only met one time in the entire two-year process. So um, as a consequence, the, the folks who are part of the 130th and the new legislature who's part of the 131st have never really conducted hearings and work sessions with the public in front of them taking testimony. Um, and so uh, to make it clear, the legislature has made the decision that that is how they'll conduct business this year. They will do regular public hearings. They will take testimony in person. They're encouraging that, in fact. But they also are allowing people to participate electronically if that's what they want. Um, different committees are handling electronic testimony differently. Um, some, I think, plan to mix it in. So they'll have people who are in the committee room testify and they'll have people who are um, online mix in. Some are going to hold all the online testimony until everyone who's there in person has had the chance to speak. I think what's important to note here is, um, and something that the chamber felt strongly about was that the extension of public participation in the process, you know, not only front facing testimony, but the ability to testify electronically open the door for a lot of folks to participate in the process. And that door will remain open this session. The, the added benefit for the, those of us who work on the, on the third floor is that we will also be able to speak directly with legislators. And quite frankly, there's less of a chance they can avoid us, um, which was a very real fact as over the last two years. Uh, the only other thing I think I would add is there's been some question about how legislators will participate and will they need to be in the committee room or will they be able to take testimony uh, and, you know, electronically, remotely? The answer is sort of for both. Um, legislators are expected to be in the committee room participating in the process in person. Under certain circumstances, legislators can seek the approval of the presiding officers and take testimony from home. They don't count as part of the quorum of the committee. They can vote electronically, but they must be on camera in order to do it. I think this process is an evolving process. Um, we will see how it goes as, as the session progresses. I think part of that is going gonna, is gonna to depend on what's the spread of COVID like out there this winter, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
But I wanted all, we wanted all of you to know that the ability to participate in person is there this session. It's encouraged by the legislature. And for those of us that seek grassroots assistance, it's encouraged by us as well. So I'm gonna hand it back to Linda. Oh, Simon. Oh, sorry, Simon. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Peter. And good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here with us. Um, I'm Simon West, and I help the team oversee education workforce legislation. Uh, priorities for us for this session are the expansion of CTE programs and other experiential learning opportunities, as well as the attraction and retention of the workforce in early childhood education, K-12, and CTE programs. Uh, to do this, I monitor the Education Cultural Affairs Committee, as well as the IDEA Committee. Um, of the slightly north of 200 bills that have been printed with language, uh, 20 of them have been assigned to the Education Cultural Affairs Committee and nine are assigned to the IDEA Committee. Of the 29, uh, we're currently monitoring four. Uh, there's just some further digging to understand the scope of the bill's implications uh, before we take a different approach to what we're gonna do with them. Of the bills we are monitoring, there's quite a wide range of what they speak to. Uh, there's one for expanding free community college program, a bill to expand access to CTE programs, one that will help to increase the number of education professionals and a school funding bill. Uh, these are all in the Education Cultural Affairs Committee and none of them are scheduled for any type of public hearing or work session, but I certainly look forward to uh, working with these committees and this team as the session progresses. And from here, I will hand it back to Linda. Thank you. Hello, um, we are, I'm gonna talk about priorities for the taxation committee. We are really excited to put together, uh, put forth four pieces of legislation this year. The first one is an act to extend the Pine Tree Zone Development Program. That is sponsored by my, Maddie Daughtry. That will extend it two years. However, the governor's put in her budget an extension for five years. <laughs> so we can't argue with that. That's gonna be even better. Um, the other bill, um, workforce training uh, credits. Troy Jackson is sponsoring an act to encourage workforce training investments. We have not met with him yet. Um, we're assuming it's gonna be a refundable tax credit of up to either $1,200 to $2,500 per employee. So this is huge. It could be first in the nation. I haven't been able to find any other state that does a refundable workforce training credit. So that's that's a positive thing. Or we're working, we're looking forward to working with Troy on this, and I think he's excited about it. The other bill, an act to promote research and development in the state by improving the research expense tax credit. This bill is being sponsored by Mo Terry. What this bill will do is um, increase the credit amount from five to 10% under the current R&D tax credit. It's also gonna lower the threshold. So currently, to, in order to take the credit, you have to look back three years of what you've spent on R&D, take the average, and if you go above that, then you can take the credit. The problem is it's really not workable for a lot of companies because they budget X amount of dollars every year. So what this would do is lower that 100% threshold to 50% to allow more folks to take it. So that's a really positive thing. The, the last bill we have um, is sponsored by Trey Stewart. It's an act to expand childcare services through public private partnership tax credits. And what this would do was be a refundable tax credit for up to $3,000 if an employer provides in-kind or just outright um, uh, childcare uh, credits for, for the employee. So that's that's our last piece of legislation. So we're really excited about these, these bills. Um, it's a very proactive agenda. And a lot of these issues are covered under main strategic plan. And a lot of these issues are issues for legislators as well on both sides of the aisle. And I know that Mo Terry, when we met with her the other day, she was very interested in the child care um, bill uh, that Trey is sponsoring as well to work with us on that. So Ben, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Um, and I just want to make sure, can, can everyone hear me? I had some uh, technical difficulties in my office and had to join via phone. So I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yep. Yes, you okay. can. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, starting off with some of our priorities, uh, the two, two I, I have two committees that I'm uh, responsible for for representing the chamber uh, in front of in the legislature. Uh, the first is the Energy Utilities Technologies Committee. Um, you know, I, I think we have three top priorities uh, in, in that committee. Uh, the first is being uh, the cost of energy, uh, something that, you know, Linda mentioned, uh, that leadership really from uh, 
all throughout the legislature and I know certainly in the in the governor's office is is a priority that I think everyone is looking at addressing. Um, over, over the summer, the chamber commissioned our in our at what we do every four years, which is our making main work report, which highlighted uh, the fact that the number two issue on the mind of businesses throughout the state right now is energy, uh, the cost of energy, uh, how we're going to adapt to the the changes that are happening. So, so with that, uh, we also thought it was critical to come up with a uh, energy strategic plan. That's something we've seen uh, the state uh, do with the long-term 10-year economic plan. We've seen it with a climate action plan. Uh, and really, there has been no, um, you know, no planning for, for how we're going to adapt to the future of, of energy with more and more solar projects coming online, uh, another procurement that will be introduced in this legislative session, uh, an offshore wind procurement, a northern Maine transmission line, uh, you know, grid modernization and, and, and plant. Uh, you know, there is certainly a lot happening in, uh, you know, the energy world right now. And we think it's important to, to come up with a plan uh, which will help lower uh, the cost of, of energy. So those are, are certainly two top priorities uh, in that committee. Another one is is broadband, something that the chamber is uh, you know continually advocating for. Uh, last year, the governor put forward uh, her her goal of having every Maine resident have access to high speed reliable broadband by 2024. That's certainly a goal that the chamber supports and one that we want to help uh, you know carry out. So I think those are our, our top three um, you know priorities in that committee. Um, you know, overall, what we've seen right now with the Energy Committee, uh, with the bill titles that I had previously mentioned, uh, there were over a uh, hundred bills that are likely to be referred to the Energy uh, Utilities Technologies Committee. Um, you know, one of the things that's that's difficult with energy is, you know, every energy policy is super, super complex. So it's not like you can point to one individual thing and say, this is how we're going to, you know, lower the cost of energy for for main businesses and, and main residents. It's going to take a, a number of, of moving parts and, and ones that we're, you know, certainly committed to doing. Shifting gears to the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, our top issue this legislative session is going to be PFAS. Um, right now, there have been about 20 bills that have been introduced uh, or, or, you know, in the bill titles that will be introduced dealing with PFAS. Uh, the, the top one that we'll be engaged on is a bill that we worked with uh, State Senator Joe Baldacci out of Bangor to submit, which is dealing with the PFAS uh, reporting requirement in products. Uh, Maine previously passed a law which uh, you know, would require companies who manufacture products uh, to test and report all those products to the Department of Environmental Protection on if they had PFAS uh, intentionally added or not. The way it was written was, uh, you know, very, very broad in definition and, and difficult for companies to be able to comply with. Uh, we're working with Senator Valdacci and, and uh, you know, a bipartisan group of legislators uh, on our bill that we've submitted, which is, uh, you know, looking at taking a more, you know, strategic surgical approach, not trying to, uh, you know, repeal the entire law. It's just trying to make it, uh, you know, significant improvements to it to, to get at the goal of what the intention of the legislation was, which is to limit the amount of PFAS that makes its way into the waste stream. So that'll be our top legislative priority, um, you know, for, for my world anyway. And I, I think it's safe to say, uh, you know, for, for the entire chamber, we've received hundreds, if not thousands of, of calls into our office regarding this issue. Um, two other things that I want to touch on. One is dealing with uh, the citizens initiative process. We've uh, worked with, um, Representative Dick Bradstreet on putting forward a piece of legislation uh, which would require uh, if a question collects the significant amount of signatures to get onto the ballot, uh, it would the election day would need to be set in an even numbered year to ensure that it's in a presidential or midterm election. Uh, the reason for doing this is to ensure the greatest amount of voter participation and turnout as possible. Uh, we've seen over the you know the last few years, um, you know, questions and, and signatures collected sort of strategically to get questions on the ballot when there is, uh, you know, an off-numbered election year and, and voter turnout is going to be lower. Um, you know, you look at 2021 when there was the, you know, New England Clean Energy Connect project that was on the ballot. Um, you know, we've really seen uh, folks take to the citizens initiative process in Maine, uh, put forward proposals that, that in our opinion, uh, hurt economic 
development and, and job growth in the state. Um, so that's something that, that we feel critical as an organization. And, you know, the perfect example looking at that is what we could be dealing with this upcoming November 2023. Uh, again, an oft, off-numbered uh, election year. And, and we're, we're facing four, potentially five uh, citizens initiative referendum questions. You have uh, the our power proposal that is put forward, which is a government owned takeover of our two uh, electric utilities, Central Maine Power and Versant. Uh, that is something that the chamber has uh, made our opposition known to and continue to make our opposition known to. You also have, uh, you know, foreign owned, uh, you know, governments, uh, companies that are backed by foreign owned government uh, from being able to not participate financially in our elections. You have a right to repair referendum, which uh, has just submitted their signatures to the Secretary of State's office this last week. Um, and then you have also the uh, $1, one billion dollar bond proposal, which says uh, if if a question is is going to the ballot for the people, which the, the state would uh, ensure more than a, taking over a billion dollar asset, it would need to go uh, to to the voters. Um, so those are four questions that we know we're going to be on the ballot. I know there's a, another potential one dealing with uh, paid family medical leave, which I'm sure um, Peter will will touch base on. But, um, you know, something that we feel critical as an organization to, um, you know, try and try and address that problem, because we really have seen um, that that process, I think, you know, not serve uh, certain projects or, or the economy well at times. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pause there and, uh, you know, turn it over to, to Peter to kind of talk about what some of his, his priorities are. Thanks, Ben. Um, the HR policy committee, uh, requested that the chamber put in two bills. Um, both of them deal with the main human rights act. They are not major pieces of legislation. They're simply reinforcing what the statute said in relation to some of the way that the Human Rights Commission has conducted business. One deals with the 180 the waiting period before they get that 100 after the 180 day right to sue letter. And the second is actually um, requiring them reemphasizing the caps that are on settlements. Um, those two bills have been submitted, uh, one by Representative Moriarty, Steve Moriarty, and one by Representative Dick Bradstreet. From the perspective of, of both the remainder of the bills, bill titles that have been submitted, and I've got two quick bills to talk about. Um, in the Health Care and Health Coverage and Insurance and Financial Services Committee, and I'm just going to speak broadly on topics this morning because as both Linda, Ben, and Simon, as, as all of them have indicated, we only have titles. There is no guarantee that any of these bills are going to go forward. And some of them are so amorphous, it's difficult to, to really understand or be sure what it is they're going to try and accomplish. And some just straight up say this is a concept draft. So in HCIFS, there are mandates. Uh, the one that jumped out at me is a requirement that health insurance coverage pays for PFAS testing. Um, uh, that's more of a, I think, a public health surveillance issue than a health insurance issue. Um, there are a couple of bills on issues the Bureau has been working on, the Bureau of Insurance has been working on. One is clear choice. Uh, which is the uh, uh, sort of homogenization of small group health insurance plans uh, to reduce choices, but make it more consistent and easy to understand for consumers. The other is the merged markets. As some of you know, the individual and small group market was, were merged uh, at the direction of the legislature. There's bills on billing for both transparency and uh, issues dealing with facilities fee, facility fees. And then there, as I indicated, general titles, an act to improve Maine's health and health care coverage, an act to lower Maine's health care coverage. We don't really know what any of that means. We have to wait and see. Um, on the labor side, uh, there are a number um, of uh, bills that deal with wages. Uh, so, for instance, there are bills on training wages, um, bills that would eliminate or change the way the minimum wage is indexed. Bills to increase the living or to adopt the living wage, uh, bills to require payout of earned paid leave, um, and and a couple of titles that deal with the requirement to post salary ranges um, on job postings. Um, there are a number of workplace issues dealing with <coughs> flexible schedules, um, overtime, and changing the overtime standard again. Um, a bill of rights for temporary workers. 
issues with wrongful, quote, wrongful termination, um, wage violations, and employee freedom of speech. Um, in workers' comp, there are a couple of workers' comp issues. Uh, workers' comp for temporary workers, and we'll talk about LD53 regarding exclusive remedy. Um, and then, of course, there's FMLA. Um, as Ben indicated, uh, FMLA is uh, currently in a, as a referendum question, or current, is currently in abeyance while the legislature deals with this issue. The uh, commission dealing with paid family medical leave met throughout last summer, fall, and winter. They did issue their recommendations. Uh, we are waiting to see a formal report submitted by them. Uh, Senator Daughtry and a couple of other people all have bills in place. Um, some are placeholders. I think it will be Senator Daughtry who spearheads this issue. Um, there are a lot of issues with the commission's reports and the recommendations they put forward. Um, but I can tell you that the legislature is, some, well, either the legislature will deal with this or we'll deal with it as a business community uh, through the referendum process. But something is going to happen with respect to paid family medical leave in the next 12 months. Um, and it will be one of the marquee issues of the legislative session. There are a lot of there's a lot of commitment on the part of leadership to see something passed. I think the question is, does something come out of what the commission recommends in Senator Daughtry's bill the business community can live with and work with? Um, there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions on that. There are recommendations that the commission put forward, but there are some items they kicked the can down the road to and left it up to the Labor Committee. Um, obviously, that's somewhat disconcerting for us, um, but we will have to wait and see uh, how this issue unfolds as the legislature really gets back into it. There are two bills that have been printed I just want to bring to folks' attention. The first one, LD12, doesn't affect everybody, but it deals with Maine's long-standing severance pay law in Maine. If you have over 100 employees at a single site for a 12-month period and you are a manufacturer or a commercial enterprise, operating enterprise, not defined, I might add, then you fall under um, the main severance pay law. And if you close or relocate or lay off workers in a certain manner, you must pay your workers a week's salary for every year that they have worked. This law has been around since the 1960s. It's been tweaked along the way. This bill would do two things. It would eliminate the terms commercial and manufacturing and thus sub subject every employer, regardless of the type of employer that they are, to main severance pay requirements. Secondly, there's a requirement in the law that says if you, you, in order to be eligible for severance pay, you have had to work for the same employer for three years. They eliminate that. So that means every employee, regardless of their length of service, would be eligible for some form of severance pay under a, cover, under a covered employer. That bill has not been scheduled for public hearing. The second bill is LD53, and that's a workers' compensation bill. It removes intentional acts and omissions regarding workplace harassment from the exclusive remedy provision of workers' comp. But what this does in reality is eliminates exclusive remedy in general, um, because what is an intentional act and what is an omission? And who conducts the intentional act? Is it the employer against an employee, another employee against another employee? And thus, the way the system works is in Maine, all employers are required to pay for and provide workers' compensation coverage. In exchange, they cannot be sued in the workplace for, a wrong, for wrongful injury, negligence, or whatever. This bill pierces <clears throat> that exclusive remedy provision. It's an extremely troubling bill. It's one that we're, the chamber is going to be watching very carefully as we go forward. Um, and it's probably right now, I would say, without knowing what some of the other titles were, the most troubling of the workers' comp bills. So with that, I think I hand it back to Linda. And yeah, then let I me, yeah, let go me ahead. pick up on that, Pete. Yeah, I mean, we've you've heard from us, and um, we appreciate your attention. Now it's our turn to hear from you. Linda, I will ask you a favor. I am experiencing similar problems with um, my internet connection. Okay. And I cannot access the chat room. Uh, so would you take a look there and let's begin with some of the questions or comments that have been put forth. Would you manage yep. that for me, please? Yep. Um, let me see here. I'm looking down through the questions.
Well, some of them are comments that are yeah, they're more comments. Also... A lot of these are comments. Um, uh... Well, for instance, the first question deals with uh, the workforce and childcare. Um, I think that is going to be a very important issue this session. There are a lot of bill titles on that issue. How that works out is really unclear. Um, and how much money the legislature is willing to spend to address the issue of child care. There is a bill, as far as the business community goes, that would provide a tax credit to an employer that had an on-site child care facility. That only addresses part of the concern and the issue that, uh, with regard to child care, on-site child care in the past. Liability is a significant barrier, and so that will have to be figured into the mix as well. Linda, I mean, do you have access to the rest? Yeah, with respect, to, with respect to child care, I think you're going to see a lot of bills dealing with credits from an employer and an employee standpoint. I know Mo Terry has one in there just like that. Um, we have ours in there that deals with the employer credit. So child care, I think you're going to see something on this. I don't know what, but you are going to definitely see something on this. Um, our ours, this, that, she, go ahead. Shanna with the LA Metro Chamber has her, has her hand raised. Shanna, I'll unmute you so you can ask your question. Thanks. Um, I've been talking with both our um, business leaders and just got off a call with our hospitality sector to talk about some of the policy priorities for them. We're hearing some of um, childcare is, is there, uh, housing is there, um, and it's both affordability and accessibility, as well as transportation. And for our members, it's specifically through the lens of addressing workforce challenges. Um, and, and so then also any kind of related workforce policy. The thing that did just come up um, that was added to that list of priorities is the cost of energy. And I know that there's the state referendum that's kind of um, masquerading as somehow a, a discount on, on energy costs. And we're of the position that that's not really the best move for, for our state. But um, what else are you seeing for, for addressing energy costs for businesses? Ben, you want to pick that up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, great question, uh, Shana. And, and as I, uh, you know, previously mentioned, it, it's difficult because, you know, there's not a sort of one size fits all approach when when dealing with energy. It comes in a in a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different entities. And you know, certainly if it's, uh, you know, a, a procurement that is, you know, being introduced, uh, you know, to get more. Uh, you know, renewables onto the grid. I mean, I think what we're seeing right now is the reason that the cost of energy is is so expensive is is due to just the you know global supply chain around natural gas and the you know New England region being so heavily reliant on natural gas to fuel our grid. Um, you know, I mean, if if we could sit here and and build another you know pipeline for. Uh, you know, Western from New York through Western Massachusetts. I mean, that would be the the quickest solution to help alleviate uh, the cost of energy. Um, you know, so I think it's it's going to come up in forms of of several different procurements to get more uh, you know access to the grid for other sources of alternative energy. So we have a, you know a, a diverse energy portfolio. Um, you know, I know the the public advocates office is is had a you know a group that has been uh, meeting which which the chamber has been a part of, which is you know what can we do about the standard offer? Is there something we can do to sort of you know reform the um, you know the standard offer? Um, you know, there's a bill that's been introduced to have greater transparency in the supply side of uh, your uh, electric bill, because again, that's really where we're seeing the most significant cost increases on the, the supply side of the, uh, the equation. Um, so, you know, I know that's sort of a, a broad answer, Shanna, but, you know, like I said, there's, there's not a, you know, unfortunately one, you know, simple solution. It's going to have to be a multi, uh, you know, multifaceted type approach, which is why we believe, um, the need for a, you know, strategic energy plan to accommodate all these different things that are happening uh, is in, you know, the best interest for the state. It's one that the uh, Energy Committee has tried in the past, but just never really been able to, to garner, um, you know, garner the support of. So uh, it, it's certainly something that we will be, you know, engaging in and looking for, for any opportunities possible to, um, to help with that, you know. There's the, the there's another question here on paid leave. It appears it will be funded through a payroll tax, but Governor Mills seems pretty adamant on not raising taxes. Could you see a scenario where she would veto a paid leave bill or let it go into law without her signature? Peter? I don't think I can see a scenario in which she vetoes a paid family medical leave bill. 
Um, and I, it, given the magnitude of the issue, I also don't see her um, letting it go into uh, become law without her signature. Um, there, the issue of the payroll tax is a very real um, issue, not only for you know employers but employees. And so, how that manages to shake out is unclear. One of the questions the commission kicked down the road is, okay, we're going to pay for this with the payroll tax, but how do you divide? You know, if it's one percent, which was the number they threw around. Is it 75% to the employee and 25% to the employer? Do they exempt employers with 15 or fewer employees from the payroll tax at all? Or is it 50-50 between the two still exempting the small businesses? None of that's clear, and that's what the legislature will, will have to decide. To my knowledge, the governor hasn't staked out a position on this issue. And so I'm not sure um, how that's, you know, how that's going to work out. And, and how it's going to unfold. It's just too early to tell. There really have been no discussions about it. Um, the, the other question is, would it be would be interested to know in both both in person testimony and Zoom testimony allowed, how do you see the committees managing time with 2,200 bills? I, I personally, I've seen a, a legislature with 2,200 bills. I think they're going to manage it. They're going to have to. Um, and I don't see that them not managing it. So um, you know, you may see uh, what they typically do is, especially in the taxation committees, they lump bills that are uh, typically of the same subject together and they take them all in one day. Um, that's how they, a lot of times they manage those types of issues. I don't know if Peter or Ben have any other comments, but I, I see them managing it. Um, it's not unheard of that they've had yeah, that in the past. Yeah, let's move on. I see Terry Crocker has her hand up for a while. So Terry, you want somebody unmute? There you go. Hi. So... I was wondering in the bill with the employers um, bringing on child cares in their program, you talked about the liability. Has it been worded at all about maybe collaborating with community programs? I'm Sagatahawk County. We have BIW, who's a huge business. Um, and being able to branch out for their employees and collaborating to have maybe so many slots in each program open for their employees, maybe giving a little kickback to the community. Um, it is a huge, it would be huge for these bigger businesses to actually find space in their community to open a program for the employees. But maybe in the bill, there could be something where we could collaborate with already existing mm -hmm. programs, keeping the workforce going, helping the families in the community, and keeping the liability where it's already being paid for. Just a thought. You know, I, I let me let me take that issue. I think my computer, my internet's working now. I I think what you said will be actually end up being part of the solution. I think everybody is interested in recognizing housing, childcare, broadband are essential to getting arms around the workforce, and we're seeing evidence today. <clears throat> where BIW, like you said, uh, where Jackson Lab and other companies are stepping into that space. But to your point of collaborating, I think you will find in order to be able to solve this problem to the extent that we need to, in order to address workforce, it will be vital that it be a collaborative effort involving all of us. I don't have any question about that. Most of our communities, I think a big problem, you know, I've been advocating for quite some time now and there's not space. There's not okay. suitable space to make this work. And right now, what I'm finding in my childcare business is that the cost is outrageous. Families mm -hmm. can't afford this. I mean, we are sinking families. Families are choosing to not be in the workforce because they can't afford it. We've got childcare subsidy programs that are like, you're $10 over, you're not getting any help. Like, we've got to come up with a plan that's going to work for these families. They're they're turning down raises so that they can get assistance. Yep. I have no question about it. It's affordability and availability. There's no question about it. Linda, do we have other questions? Yeah. Um, one, workforce participation rate continues to decline while job openings increase. Any bills this session on able-bodied work requirements to receive benefits or anything addressing the welfare cliff? Um, I, I did mention earlier that we heard from the Senate R's that um, welfare reform is going to be something that they are going to be focusing on. Um, beyond that, I'm not 
I haven't seen anything other than in the bill titles. Um, yes, there are there are bills on all of those issues. There are titles okay. on all of those issues. Yep. Yeah. On the issue yeah, of PTO, go yeah, go ahead. On the, on the issue of PTO added to vacation accrual, I don't think that will happen. Um, I don't see any bills specifically on that issue. There are titles related to earned paid leave, which, as you know, um, upon departure, you don't have to pay it out. Um, and the rules that the department put forward keep that in place. Um, but I don't I mean we negotiate we negotiated that last session and PTO was specifically left out. And it wasn't the target of the people that wanted to put the bill in the legislation in. So I don't expect it. But honestly, as Linda pointed out, there's a lot that we don't know about this session. So we'll see. Janet Kelly has a question. Janet, I think also has her hand up. Do you want to uh, unmute her? Hi, uh, this is kind of related to uh, what Peter just said about PTO. Is there an opportunity to revisit eligibility for um, the paid leave? Uh, primarily in higher ed, we have adjunct professors, several hundred, um, who don't have a set schedule. So primarily they work online, they post their courses whenever they want, um, can have their classes kind of, they have the flexibility. And same with per diem employees that don't work on a set schedule, it's an on-call. The current required paid leave um, doesn't really um, capture those scenarios. So we have employees who are accruing leave, but never have an opportunity to take it because they're already flexible. So they kind of work when they want to work as it is. So basically all we're doing is accruing a week's pay that 40 hours. So when they leave, they get an extra week of pay. So I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to kind of revisit that and talk about those things. I did bring it up in the public sessions and was kind of told, oh, well, it is what it is. So I wish they had better news for you, um, but you, you, you know, there may be an opportunity to bring the issue of per diem employees um, up, but the legislature and supporters of the earned paid leave law were very clear that they intended to sweep those very employees in and allow them access to earn paid leave. So that would, and at the end of the day, I mean, you would pay them for an extra week. Um, they, they were they were adamant about it, that, that uh, all the, the hospitals and the healthcare facilities brought this issue up as well because they deal with per diem employees. And they were basically told, no, we want to include those people. And thus they were. I, if there's one thing that's a truism in the main legislature is if you give somebody a benefit, you do not take it away. And I do not see that the legislature deciding they're going to take away a week's worth of earned paid leave from any employee now that they have it. We don't have a lot of time left, but there was a comment that was made that you hear on occasion. And when you speak with the community college on the benefits of free tuition, that's also in the governor's budget for 24-25, um, you hear clear convincing uh, support from the community college, not surprisingly, uh, as to its benefit. But as was pointed out in one of, the, one of the comments that I no longer have access to, so I may be expressing it in error, but the concern was, you know, we don't argue with that, but it, it puts the private colleges and others kind of in a, a, in a, um, a questionable place. And it was more of a comment, but it is one that because it's in the budget, proposed budget, um, and because of the experience of the past during the pandemic, it will be around. It'll be one that will be addressed. Um, and um, ex concerns expressed. So if, if there is that concern out there, then the time to deal with it is with your legislature, particularly appropriations. Any other questions? Linda, any comments that we've overlooked or? Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, and I, I just wanna mention it. Um, this, this session, grassroots is gonna play a really important role in what we do. 
Um, I can tell you that um, because of the lack of institutional memory of some of the newer legislators, that is gonna be a, a very important piece of what we do. So you look for our action alerts. Um, when, we, when we call you, we need you. <laughs> Um, that's a definite. So on the uh, grassroots is going to play a huge part, a huge role this session. That's the only comment I really wanted yeah. to make. So we, we do have room for another question, uh, question maybe even two. two, depending on how long the question is. Is there anything in there, Linda, that's glaring at you that we have overlooked? Will there be small business day at the state house this year? We have just business day. We don't distinguish between small and large and medium. We have business day at the state house, I believe. That is on the 30th, I think. I'll have to check. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, we do have business day. Look on our website. You will see the events calendar and that will be on there. And knowing the profile of Maine being 80% having fewer than 20 <laughs> employees and SBA's definition of under 500, which would be 99% of our businesses, <clears throat> I suspect we'll have a lot of small business. We haven't been able to hold it in the last couple of years. For the reasons that the staff have noted, the legislature has simply not been open for that opportunity. But it is an important part because it brings the voice to Augusta of the business community and allows you to reach out. So we hope you'll take advantage of it. It is important and it pays dividends. Um, Dana, can, can I add yeah. one more one more point to Senator Langley's question about process and yeah, management? I think the institution is going to be significantly challenged um, for a variety of different reasons to deal with 2,300 bills. I have not seen 2,300 bills in a single session. I've seen it over two years. And so the institution isn't really set up for that. It's complicated by um, the way testimony, you know, in-person and electronic testimony. Um, and it will, and we were all told that testimony is going to be limited to three minutes. So you have 2,300 bills. Um, a lot of this legislation is very complex and you can't explain your position um, in three minutes to a legislative body that doesn't understand it themselves. Um, and with two different group, two different classes of legislators not experiencing um, in-person public hearings and work sessions yet, um, I think the institution is really gonna be challenged to deal with this. That's just my two cents worth but I've been around for 17 mm -hmm. legislatures. So um, I think this would be one of the most challenging. Yeah, as we said at the very beginning, uh, when we opened up today's program, that this is the beginning, not the end. There is more to come, more that we'll know, but I would encourage all of you uh, to, if you have access, to be sure that you tune in on, I see Brian has raised his hand. I'll get to you in a second, Brian. But <laughs> The, but to attend our Monday morning briefings with our business community and also our, our local regional chambers, our weekly impact, uh, but also if you are a member, join one of the committees. That's where bills get processed. And, and we all know that um, necessity is a mother of invention or invention is a mother of necessity. However that saying goes, this legislature will find a way because there is no option. Brian. Brian, you still there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Peter, you hit right on <clears throat> having sat, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> as chair of the education committee when it was, uh, you know, bills about uh, getting school consolidation. And even when you lumped them, we'd have as many as 14 and 15 bills on the same subject in one day. That would be an, an eight or 10 hour day just on on one set of bills. Uh, and, and the piece for me is when you add in the, if they're allowing people to zoom in testimony, you know, um, if we're asking, as uh, Linda just said about grassroots and, and coming in, I could see uh, us, uh, you know, those of us that are running businesses and uh, being able to, you know, uh, if say if Linda calls and says, okay, we're going to be testifying today and uh, just sitting in the wings and okay, it's my turn to testify via Zoom. You could stretch you could stretch a day out for 12 or 14 hours on a particular bill. Um, so I think they'll they're going to quickly want to give up that electronic piece because the the days will just go on forever. Um, uh, and to Peter's point, uh, with so many of them not knowing how this goes in person over the past two years, uh, they're going to be bludgeoned to death 
um, um, by, by some of uh, these bills like this. So I'm just curious to watch and see how quickly they're, they're going to have to try to give this up to manage a, a 2,200 bill. So, and um, and one, one of the no. things that, that's going to be really critical because that testimony is limited to three minutes, it is going to be absolutely critical that the, the time between the, the public hearing and the work session getting legislators and talking to them. That is gonna be the, the critical piece here because as you, as Peter said, you, you're not gonna really have a lot of time to, to discuss bills and in, in three minutes. I mean, um, it's gonna be critical that folks are over there talking in between to folks and let, letting them know before the work session happens. Yeah, I mean, it, we can't control what we can't control, right. but, I, but we do know what our priorities are and we do know how to manage the issues. And I'm convinced, I'm very comfortable in saying this will occur. They may have to make changes uh, to accommodate what's been expressed here today. But once they get into the, into the process, those opportunities will be there. For us, it's taken a lot of the issues we discussed with you today and more that we'll need to find out as time goes on and be sure that our focus is on the issues that affect the economy and the business community, the employer and the employee. And that's what we are committed to do. That is within our power. And that's what we'll keep you informed on and about. And um, look forward to seeing a German on June the 15th with a lot of positive results. So with that, thank you very much for being with us and be sure to join us next Thursday, the 26th, as we bring you, as we meet with our commissioners, those that are available to meet with us in the same as today, to allow them to share with us what's on their agenda for this session. And they are an important part of what gets done. And uh, they're all great to work with in terms of our experience. And it'll be, we'll look forward to having them with us next Thursday, the 26th at nine o'clock in the morning. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.